Good morning, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Block Thrasher Daily Crypto Update. We're going to do some therapy today. We need some crypto therapy. Look at the market. Everything is red. It hurts. It's bloody. It's like an agglomeration of wrecked, ruined, bruised, beaten, and battered, bloody cryptos. <laughs> Everything is down. It doesn't feel good. Like I said, welcome to another episode of the Block Thrasher Daily Crypto Update, where we are simplifying crypto by shattering the complexities with news, commentary, analysis, and education. It is Tuesday, June 8th, 6.53, where I sit in the beautiful state, beautiful, beautiful state of Idaho. The sun is just about to come up over the horizon. The birds are chirping just outside the window. I don't know if you can hear them. You probably can't. Looks like it's going to be a beautiful day. Yesterday was incredible. The temperature was just perfect. I don't know if you experience a lot of days like that where you live, but it was like Garden of Eden style perfection. <laughs> it, it was it was so nice. Just was able to hang out with some friends later on in the evening and sit around, play some cornhole and enjoy that beautiful, beautiful weather. It, it was just almost surreal. It was so perfect. Let's take a look at what's going on with cryptocurrency market here today. Oh, but before we do that, our word of the day, agglomeration, A-G-G-L-O-M-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. An agglomeration is a jumbled cluster or mass of varied parts. Agglomeration, it can also be the act or process of agglomerating, just bringing together a bunch of stuff, piling it all into a a lump, right? An agglomeration. Good word. I like it. Use it actually quite regularly. All right. What's happening in the market is is not, 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 not fun right now. Not for those who have invested in the cryptocurrency space. We're not, it's not like a you know, devastating, it's not devastation. Sorry, I had to grab a sip of coffee there. Open the coffee helps the mind speed up a little bit so that I can be more fluid, clear, concise, hopefully not loquacious or obtuse. Mm, that's some good coffee. Total market cap down, down almost 10%. And we saw $300 billion just disappear like that. Total market cap is at one56 two trillion dollars today bitcoin dominance is down 39.6 percent ethereum at 18.7 and gas prices continue to be incredibly low as they have been for the last couple of days bitcoin currently thirty three thousand dollars thirty three thousand thirty three to be exact, down 11.6%. That's pretty significant for Bitcoin. Usually, I, I, what I mean by that is in relation to what's happening with the rest of the altcoins. If you look at the weekly numbers, Bitcoin down 11.6%, Ethereum down only 7.1%, Binance not down at all, Cardano down 12%, XRP 17%, Polkadot down 6.9%. So this is a little bit different than what we normally see when Bitcoin will go down 5 or 6%. They also go down 10 or 15%. But right now, Bitcoin is down just as much. And that kind of fits with what we've been seeing of late, where Bitcoin has been struggling relative in relation to the alts. And that's why its dominance has been dropping as well. Today, Ethereum is 2,513 Binance is 353, Cardano $1.52, Dogecoin 32 cents, XRP 86 cents. Interestingly as well, USD coin is now in the top 10. So we've got Tether and USDC both in the top 10, which would indicate that a lot of people are dumping and going into the stable coins 
probably in a move hoping that we're going to continue to go down a little bit further and they could buy back in possibly, or they're just panic selling and going into the stable coins. Also an op- uh, possibility. Polka dot 2171 down 6.9%. Uniswap 2316 Bitcoin cash 593 Litecoin 158, Chainlink 24, and Solana. Solana, now, at this point, the only crypto within the top 15 to be seeing a gain in the last seven days. It's still up 11.9%. Now, if we go into the top 20, Theta Network is also seeing a nice increase on the week, up 26.3%. But in the last 24 hours, pretty much everything is just getting whacked. Why is that? What happened over the last couple of days? Well, we talked yesterday about former President Donald Trump's statements. I don't think that had that much to do with it, but it could be a factor. We talked about that yesterday. He came out saying that Bitcoin is scammy to him, and he is a supporter of the dollar and wants the dollar to be the only currency of the world, the reserve currency of the world. Very interesting statement. Ridiculous. Doesn't understand it. It's asinine. What else has happened? Today, the big news has to do with the Colonial Pipeline ransomware ransom attack and the hacking or seizing or recovery of some of that money that was paid out by the Colonial Pipeline. And we're going to talk about that. But before we talk about that, we need to do some therapy. We need some good news, don't we? We need some encouragement. So I'm going to bring that to you here. We've got a couple things that can help with that just a little bit. First off, Kraken's Jesse Powell doubles down on the his huge, huge year-end Bitcoin price prediction. Jesse Powell, CEO of crypto exchange Kraken, is doubling down on his huge year-end price prediction for Bitcoin despite the deep pullback that saw Bitcoin losing over 50% of its value from the all-time high. In an interview with Bloomberg, the Kraken chief says he stands by his previous statements that by the end of 2021, one Bitcoin will be worth around one Lamborghini. He said this, quote, I stand by that. So look, you can buy a Ford delivery of a Lambo now at a discount, a cheap $37,000. Lots of people are buying the dip. Personally, I'm Googling how to sell my kidneys at this point. Turns out it's illegal. (laughs) Hey, what do you know? Jesse's got a bit of a sense of humor. I think people are getting ready to go on ramen diets to buy Bitcoin at these levels. I think just everything with what's happening in Miami right now, the excitement around the space is so hot. I think people see this growing massively. So I'm not worried about this little dip. He's not worried about this little dip at all. Continuing on, he says, we've seen this over and over. Crypto is a roller coaster. You got to be able to have an iron stomach to tolerate the ride, but the gains are massive for those who can handle it. That's right. That is so true. The statement, if you can't handle the fire, get out of the kitchen. is kind of true with crypto. If you can't handle the volatility, if you can't stomach seeing your portfolio Go down painful, in painful ways, at painful levels, then you're you're not, it's not for you. And then the excitement that goes, because it can be a roller coaster. You get hit, it's down. Oh my, I lost so much money. Boom, just as quickly, it can go up. And it does. Powell adds that the new investors should not be betting their rent money on Bitcoin and should not view it as a week-to-week swing trade. Amen to that. According to him, a 5-10 to year time preference 
is the best way to go for Bitcoin investing. Quote, people should absolutely not be betting any more than they can afford to lose. It's still a very risky investment, but obviously over time, if you look at the chart, 10 years ago, Bitcoin was trading at a dollar. Today, $36,000. Year over year, it's up 200%. So long term, it's an absolutely fantastic investment from my point of view. Absolutely agree with the Kraken CEO, Jesse Powell. So keep that in mind. Don't lose heart. When you see the portfolio down 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50%, this is what happens in crypto. Stand by your iron, you know, build an iron gut. I don't know how you do that, but emotionally is what we're talking about. Emotionally, have the fortitude, have the resilience, have the strength to persevere, to, to hold on, to not panic. And you will do well, as Jesse Powell is stating. Here's some other good news. White House advisor, a White House advisor by the name of Tim Wu, who is a member of the National Economic Council, holds Bitcoin and Filecoin. His financials revealed that his cryptocurrency, his investments account for more than 25% of his assets. Tim Wu serves as a special assistant to President Biden on technology and competition policy. This is great. So according, so he holds 1 million, somewhere between 1 million and 5 million worth of Bitcoin and over $100,000 worth of Filecoin. Filecoin. Well, there's a little bit more detail here. Wu recently had, uh, he, re he filed a financial disclosure revealing that he holds between 1 million and 5 million Bitcoin, as well as 100,000 and 250,000 in Filecoin. His net worth is between 4 million and 11.5 million, with his Bitcoin holdings representing at least 25% of his assets. Three word notes. It also lists his sources of income as a professor of the University of Columbia, a columnist for the New York Times, and other appearances. During Crypto's 2017 bull run, Wu authored an opinion piece for the New York Times commenting that Bitcoin was a bubble but that it had captured something, quote, captured something. Apart from Bitcoin, you know, sometimes these articles that are written by some of these, you know, crypto news outlets or whatever, they just say the same thing. Like they repeat what they're saying 10 different times. <laughs> they're like, okay, <laughs> a little bit ridiculous. Also, a little bit more therapy for us. We are going to cover some analysis of the market this being brought to us by sentiment you can check that out if you'd like sentiment being one of the better analytics analysis companies within the cryptocurrency space website is insights.sentiment.net here is what this report is stating and it's mostly mostly positive let's look at this here starting with bitcoin whale behavior the key bitcoin whale holder demographic we generally look at is addresses with 100 to 10,000 Bitcoin held. This has been rising steadily for about two and a half weeks now. This appears to be a dip that the whales are buying with confidence. And if you're on the video, you can see that chart. In the last two weeks, the addresses with 100 to 10,000 Bitcoin have been steadily rising. So the whales are accumulating. NVT, token circulation. Although it's early in June, the first week has not been pretty in terms of circulation. Very little amounts of unique tokens appear to be circulating on the Bitcoin network right now. And this is a concerningly bearish indicator. We're hoping to see improvement as the month progresses. Address activity. Address activity has been declining in tandem with token circulation, so much so, in fact, that June 5th, 2021 was the lowest amount of address of addresses interacting on the Bitcoin network in nearly a year. So that's not that's not good. That's not positive. BitMEX perpetual contract funding rate. BitMEX's perpetual contract funding rate has been negative, indicating a clear growth in short positions. Seeing this is a clear reflection of the crowd 
becoming increasingly bearish, which is a sign that there may be openings coming soon to successfully buy into crowd fear. Crowd bearishness equals fundamental bullishness. That's a very important thing to remember and to keep in mind. This idea that crowd bearishness equals fundamental fundamental bullishness. It's sort of another way of saying that is the classic statement from Warren Buffett that when everyone else is fearful, that's the time to be greedy. And when everyone else is greedy, then that's the time to be fearful. Another way to state that would be buy low, sell high, or buy during the dip, buy after the dip, buy after the panic. Don't sell in the panic. Don't sell it into the panic. Don't sell at the bottom of the panic. Don't buy at the top, at the all-time high. Same thing. Crowd bearishness equals fundamental bullishness. And we, and we definitely see that. We definitely see that. I know even for me, thinking through my emotional response to the market in the last few weeks, we, we were on this tear. We were enjoying this bull market. We were seeing all-time new highs across the board, Bitcoin, etc. Then we got hit pretty hard, 30, 40, almost 50% on a lot of things. Started to recover. All right, this is good. Seeing some of the alts like Cardano reach new all-time highs again. We get hit again. Another week goes by, we start to see this recovery. We're getting back to some of the alts near all-time highs. Now, Bitcoin's been struggling. Bitcoin has been struggling to get above 35 or, or even close to 40. We get hit again. That's happening today. So it's been a, definitely more of an up, down, up, down, seesaw, roller coaster ride right now. And this can cause people within the space, investors, to get weary, right? To get tired of the volatility, to get sort of, oh, man, that sigh. Wow, this is starting to, oh, gosh. I was just hoping we'd, we'd go back into a, a more of a recovery or, return to the, to the bull market quicker. And it might not happen. It might take some time. We're still seeing, you know, we're shaking out the weak hands, right? That fear has to, to kick in, settle in. You know, the retail people, I hate to say it, but the new people that came in and bought too high, they got to get flushed out it, often. They're not going to hold. They're going to panic. They're going to sell. The whales, the institutions, they know that. They're going to pick those up. And then we can move back, move on. It's just the process, the cycle that happens. You just be make sure that you're not one of those that, be, that succumbs to that and becomes a victim of that. Supply on exchanges. Bitcoin supply on exchanges is declining once again after reaching a major spike just prior to the recent bottom two weeks ago. It's a bullish sign to see that Bitcoin supply is again moving away from exchanges and locked into offline wallets for safekeeping. So that's another good sign from the analytics. Weighted social sentiment. What's going on with that? Commentary toward Bitcoin is at its most negative sentiment since late April. And this is another bullish sign. When the crowd is in doubt, buying with confidence is justified. Yes, and this has been a lot of FUD has resulted in this social sentiment dropping. So another good bullish sign. MVR. Average trader returns are well into the negative range, as would be expected after a 50% dip from Bitcoin's all-time high back in mid-April. A negative 18.7% 30-day MVRV is historically a bullish indication. So as you can see, we're stacking up the bullish indicators here. What about Ethereum? Ethereum whale addresses holding between 1,000 and 100,000 ETH aren't really budging much during this ranging period in the mid-2000 price level. This group of holders is still hanging on to massive amounts of tokens. It first began accumulating at a rapid rate beginning last October. So that's bullish. 
NVT token circulation, the amount of circulation for Ethereum has been slowing down considerably in June and dropping more than half of its market cap in less than a month has caused hesitation from traders. Now we see that being reflected in the gas prices. Circulation is down. People are not transacting. Our NVT model is showing its first bearish bar since April 2020. So that's a bearish sign signal. What about address activity? Address activity for Ethereum has been declining since mid-May's all-time high. And although it hasn't seen quite the sudden fall off that Bitcoin is experiencing, this lack of ETH address interaction is a bearish concern. Now, see, here's the thing. Sentiment is going through the analytics for Bitcoin and Ethereum because they're number one and number two. And because they, we still, we have not entered into decorrelation yet within the cryptocurrency space. Sadly, it's just what it is. Bitcoin goes down, everything goes down with it. Ethereum also, the theory being that Ethereum is also having a similar impact currently. However, that being said, a factor here that isn't discussed in the analytics but that we can bring into a big picture is that a lot of what was going on in Ethereum is now being captured by Binance Smart Chain and some of the others that are starting to pick pick that up, the DeFi going on, but primarily right now, Binance Smart Chain and people moving to Polygon and using the Polygon DeFi dApps to do what they once were doing on Ethereum. So, you know, this kind of, that kind of skews things just a little bit in this regard. What about BitMEX perpetual contracts funding rate? For Ethereum, a BitMEX contract funding rate of just 0.043% is considered extremely low compared to Ethereum's normal resting average. There is plenty of doubt in the air for crypto's number two asset, and the ratio actually went negative for the first time in more than a year earlier this week. This is indicative of crowd fear, which is a bullish event. Supply on exchanges. Exchanges supply is essentially holding par right now, if not ticking down slightly again. A lot of Ethereum holders appear to be waiting to see what Bitcoin's next big move is. But right now, the long-term pattern of keeping ETH tokens off exchanges is still very clearly bullish. Ethereum's negative social sentiment is dipping down to levels that haven't been seen since October 2020. This crowd doubt is extremely indicative of a capitulation event if it lasts for too much longer. MVRV. Ethereum's 30-day MVRV is still quite low after the monster drop off from its all-time high about four weeks ago. While it's at negative 13.4% or anywhere in the negatives for that matter, it's going to be a less risky time to buy than usual. All right, some good analytics there for us to uh, consider. Also, in the news today, Polkadot says it's ready to begin auctioning off its parachain slots. Now, this could be bullish news for Polkadot because it means that we're going to start seeing a lot of projects getting launched on the Polkadot ecosystem. I have a, a few thoughts about this, but before I bring that to you, let me just run through the overview of what this is about. So the team behind the blockchain protocol Polkadot says the platform is ready to begin auctioning off its parachain slots. Auctioning off these slots will allow more blockchains to deploy onto the Polkadot network and interact with other blockchains. Polkadot creator Galvin Woods wrote in a blog post. So what happens with Polkadot is that you have the settlement chain, which is Polkadot, and think of it like a, a wheel with spokes. 
and they have a hundred slots for these other parachains, which would be another crypto project to slot to attach to the polka dot chain, which provides the security provides the finalized settlement, right? So Cardano has a similar thing with the settlement layer. And then you can have parachains running along, processing transaction, all that, and then just sending to the settlement layer. But with Polkadot, this is, in my view, a negative because what's happened, what's happening here? So they have to auction, they're auctioning off. So, so actually, let's just, rather than me explain it, we'll just run through this really quickly here. Polkadot is a blockchain protocol designed to bring together multiple blockchains to operate seamlessly. It is meant to allow for any type of data to be sent and received between any type of blockchain. Polkadot refers to these parallel blockchains as parachains, and they can connect to the network via a limited number of parachain slots. Think spokes to a wheel. Auctioning off more parachain slots will allow more blockchains to deploy onto the Polkadot network and interact with other blockchains that are already integrated. Kusama is an experimentation network for teams preparing to deploy on Polkadot. Both Polkadot and Kusama will auction off parachain slots in a bid to more efficiently select which parachains will be added to the core part of the blockchain network. So that's the theory behind it is, you know, that there should be some expense, but it's extremely expensive actually to get one of these parachain slots. And, and because they're so limited, which is, I just don't know if this is, the right way to go about things. I mean, think with Ethereum, for instance, anybody can launch a token on the Ethereum platform using the smart contract. And, and, and yes, there's some expense to do that, but with this, you just can't launch a project unless you win an auction, a slot through auction. And that's expensive. I mean, we're talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars expensive. According to a blog post written by Gavin Woods, Ethereum co-founder and Polkadot creator, projects that receive confidence from members of the Kusama community will be prioritized. He said, it is our belief that there are no longer any known technical blocking points stopping the auctions of parachain functionality. Since the amount of protection Kusama gives is in some way proportional to the amount of time it is active prior to Polkadot, there is a clear reason for deploying this logic as soon as possible for the good of Polkadot. In the blog post, Woods recommends that the first parachain slot auction should begin on June 15th to allow members of the Kusama staking community ample time to unstake KSM so they can use the tokens for their auction bids. After this, auctions will be held back-to-back -back with a two-day period of bids, followed by a five-day ending period. In total, five auctions will take place over five weeks. The Kusama Council, and this is the part that I really wanted to talk about, and a number of stakeholders will make the final call on the parachain slot selection process. It is now in the hands of the Kusama Council, Woods wrote. So I don't know, you know, the thing is, is like the whole idea behind these, these platforms is sort of to be decentralized, sort of, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, this is kind of a form of community governance, but with, with the council and, and, and some stakeholders making the final decision of, I, I don't know. Maybe it ends up being a good thing. Maybe it's sort of will prevent, you know, crappy projects from launching on Polkadot. Maybe I'm sure that's the theory behind this here is that when, you know, there's got to be some barrier of entry, a level of barrier, you know, barrier level of entry where not just anybody can launch so easily. I, I don't know. But from the very, very beginning, when I, did a deep dive on Polkadot way back. This whole auctioning off of the parachain slots thing was, was a bit of a concern to me. And I probably forget some of the details of that analysis that I did, but I just recall that it was one of the things that, that definitely, you know, just kind of, uh, I, I don't know, not so certain about Polkadot long-term, to be honest, but we'll see. I mean, they're absolutely definitely a contender in the platform wars for the smart contract DAP ecosystems. Here's an interesting thing that just illustrates one of the strengths and reasons for decentralization 
it, it's 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 unbelievable. The story illustrates something that's unbelievable, and that is how so many major corporations and companies have now been consolidated in in terms of the technology that they use and the service providers for their networks. And so when something goes down, they all go down. So CNN, New York Times, FT, The Guardian, Reddit too, and countless of other media sites are down today or were down today with the, the error message above, error 503, service unavailable. The culprit appears to be Fastly, an edge computing, computing cloud provider used by almost all corporate media due to claiming it provides the highest speeds even for uncached content. Does it make any sense? Like, like one company, Fastly, provides the computing cloud power for all <laughs> for almost all corporate. I mean, this is just... The website of Fastly itself is currently down with the same error, with it unclear currently just what happened. There was an update about 30 minutes after global media and services like Shopify went down. Some sites now seem to be coming up, although not consistently. They're probably changing the DNS to turn off the CDN or Fastly has sorted out the problem. Fastly later said, we identified a service configuration that triggered disruptions across our POPs globally and have disabled that configuration. Our global network is coming back online. You think it'd be a, you know a security concern to have so many so many services running on the same platform that can go down because it's a centralized platform with with just a simple configuration error. All right, big story of the day, and 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 the story the the issue that might possibly be affecting the market so negatively today is this issue of the of the Department of Justice seizing colonial pipeline Bitcoin ransom. This article is asking, was it Gemini? U.S. Department of Justice has stated they seized 63.7 Bitcoin out of 75 Bitcoin paid to ransomware hackers who briefly brought down colonial pipeline. This is the first time such announcement has been made, raising the question just how they were able to take possession of the coins. And obviously, a lot of people in the news media are saying that we're alluding to where there's misunderstanding and a misconception that they hacked Bitcoin. The private key for the subject address is in possession of the FBI in the Northern District of California, the agent said in the affidavits. So that is what the FBI is stating, is that they have the private key. That's, so that's, that's crucial. That's important. It, it does, so they didn't somehow break Bitcoin. They got the private key. Now the question then is, how did they get the private key? Thus, there isn't some bureaucratic miscommunication. Law enforcement has been able to not only locate where the funds went to, but also actually take possession. How? No explanation has been given in time for publishing with the censoring prone and overclassification being leaning agency redacting even part of the address they took possession, which we were able to allocate in full. There's no risk whatever in revealing this address as far as we can conceive, except that this show shown they've taken possession of 69, 69 Bitcoin not 63.7. They've been separated. So, all right. So, so this, I'm not going to read through this whole article because it's too lengthy and it gets, it's technical and it, and it gets boring. Basically, the bottom line of what they're saying here is they their theory, and people are presenting different theories, and this is their theory here at Trust Nodes, is that when Colonial Pipeline paid the ransom, they did it, through Gemini, and they did it with the FBI possibly being involved in the action. And the FBI then, using Gemini, the address, Gemini address, to track where the payment went and to somehow 
intersect in a, in a go between in that. Now, it may also be that the hackers had a Gemini wallet address, but according to Adam Back, right? Who, if you're not familiar with, some people even speculate that Adam Back might might be Satoshi Nakamoto. He's an OG. If there's anyone who knows Bitcoin and how Bitcoin works, it's Adam Back on the technical level, right? He said Bitcoin was not hacked. He said no Bitcoin wallet was hacked, nor is even known to be possible. Ransom hackers used a rented cloud server. The FBI got a subpoena and took control of it and recovered coins. That's it. So, so, so that's what it's looking like as data starts to come out happened here was simply that the hackers run into cloud server that was based in Northern California. They got a subpoena from the company that was providing the cloud server and they went in and they got into the wallet and they recovered the funds or they found a private key in a text file or something, or they just got access to the wallet and sent the Bitcoin to another address, whatever it is. It's clear that the FBI did not somehow break the Bitcoin network or find a way to access private keys in some other way than actually having physical access to the server, which would come under the, you know, in hacking, there's technical hacking, where you can use it like a brute force attack, or you're just going through a whole bunch of, you know, you've got an you've got an application that is just running as fast as it can through possible password combinations, right? And that's what happened here. They got either the private key or the password to the wallet, right? You can hack by putting in a key logger on somebody's computer when they download an application, then everything that's typed in is seen. You could, the FBI could, if they, you know, if the FBI had a backdoor like that installed on a server, when someone types in the, the private key, they can get the private key that way, right? Uh, Key loggers can be software. They can even be hardware based. There's all different kinds of things that can be done. You, but and then there's social hacking where. But this is this looks more like it's just your typical standard law enforcement action of going in and subpoena. And this is you know this is where these guys, even though they were based out of Russia, it, you know it looks like messed up because they were using some cloud server to host their wallet. Anyway, enough on that. Yes, see, here's a court document said that the seizure took place in Northern California, putting it within reach of U.S. law and that the FBI was able to access the, quote, private key or password for one of the gang's Bitcoin wallets. It was unclear how the key was compromised. He declined to give specifics of how the FBI was able to gain access to the wallet, but he said it did not rely on waiting for criminals to use U.S. cryptocurrency services. It did, however, rely on the fact that so much Internet infrastructure is based in the U.S. where the FBI can get warrants. So there you go. That's what happened. All right, well, I think that's a wrap for today. Let's jump back real quickly before we close things up here and see if we've had any moving in the market over the last hour since I've been talking. Looks like market cap is now down 11%. So we're, we continue to see a little bit of bleeding or an increase of bleeding here. All right. Well, it's a bit painful. 
No doubt about it. Oh, we're seeing the gas prices jump up a little bit. Interesting. This looks like we are in another opportunity here. There are a number of projects that are on sale. We're seeing some 25, 26% down on Chainlink, 25% down on Polygon. Monero down 10%. Ave 16%. Could be another another good buying opportunity. It's interesting though because this is Tuesday and we normally see this happen on a on the weekends, Saturday, Sunday, Monday-ish. So the fact that this is happening on Tuesday is a little bit different than what we've seen recently. Hmm. I don't know. For me, as I think about this, and again, this is not investment advice or financial advice or anything like that <laughs> just going off of my experience the fact that it's a Tuesday and the market is down like this would give me pause to jump in and buy anything right now I would wait to the weekend to see if this goes down even further <coughs> all right friends I hope you have a good day And I will talk to you again tomorrow for the Block Thrasher Daily Crypto Update. All right, press on. Stay strong. Love you all. Talk to you soon. Bye now.